Hello learners, today we are going to study the poem To His Coy Mistress. It is a metaphysical poem written by English poet Andrew Marvel. Although the date of its composition is not known, it may have possibly been written in the early 1650s. Poetry like novel, drama and short story is a genre, a form of literature that deals with experience and aims to arouse the same experience in the reader by saying much in few words. Since language is insufficient to express our emotions, emotional attitudes which cannot be expressed in a direct statement are expressed by use of figures of speech, rhyme and rhythm. A poet uses poetic diction to express his emotions by altering the language. Poetry is an art dependent on sound and there is a blurry line between songwriting and poetry. One big distinction is that songwriters often write the music that goes with their lyrics while music of the poem is contained within the lyrics which is the arrangement of the words on the page. Some poems are about sound than others. Walt Whitman's Out of the Cradle Endlessly Rocking is about how a man who becomes a poet when he understands the song of birds. To his coy mistress doesn't go that far, but it still has a lot to do with sound. Had we but whirled enough in time, this coyness lady were no crime. We would sit down and think which way to walk and pass a long love's day. Thou, by the Indian Ganges side, Shouldest rubies find, I by the tide of humber would complain. I would love you ten years before the flood, and you should, if you please, refuse till the conversion of the Jews. My vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. An hundred years should go to praise thine eyes, and on thy forehead gaze. Two hundred to adore each breast, but 30,000 to the rest, an age at least to every part, and the last age should show your heart. For lady, you deserve this state, nor would I love at lower rate. But at my back, I always hear time's winged chariot hurrying near, and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. Thy beauty shall no more be found, nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing sound, then warm shall try that long-preserved virginity, and your quaint honour turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust. The graves are fine and private place, but none, I think, do their embrace. Now therefore, while thy youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us port us while we may, and now, like armorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour, than languish in this low chap power. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball, and tear our pleasures with rough strife, through the iron gates of life. Thus, though we cannot make our sun stand still, yet we will make him run. Reading a poem out loud, or listening carefully to it in your head is almost sure to reveal something meaningful about the poem. The first stanza where the speaker describes the idealized world in which the mistress's coyness wouldn't be a crime sounds both fast and slow. The sound of vegetable love slows us down. The pace of words like flood, refuse, and rate speeds things up until we get to the butt of the second stanza. The third stanza sounds playful and light. But what of prey, devour, tear, rough and strife? These words sound a little harsh. Andrew Marvel was born in Winstead South Yorkshire, England. 
on March 31, 1621. His father was a minister. When Andrew was three, the family moved to Hull in the country of Humberside. There he grew up and attended school. In 1639, a year after his mother died, Marvel received a bachelor's degree from Cambridge University's Trinity College. His father died in 1640. Between 1642 and 1646, Marvel travelled in continental Europe, visiting France, Netherlands, Spain, Switzerland and Italy. In 1651, he accepted a position at Nun Appleton, Yorkshire, as a tutor to 12-year-old Mary Fairfax, the daughter of Sir Thomas Fairfax, commander of the Parliamentary Army in the 1640s during the English Civil Wars. Marvel remained in that position until 1652. While at Nun Appleton, he wrote several of his most acclaimed poems including to his coy mistress and the garden between 1653 and 1657 he served as a tutor to a ward of Oliver Cromwell the Lord Protector of England Ireland and Scotland during Commonwealth period which is from 1653 to 1658 Marvel had praised Cromwell in his 1650 poem, an Horatian ode upon Cromwell's written from Ireland. In 1657, Marvel served under the great scholar and poet John Milton in the Foreign Office and in 1659 was elected to Parliament to represent Hull. Marvel was best known during his lifetime for his political achievements and his political satires in prose and verse. His best poetry was published in Miscellaneous Poems in 1681, which was taken from a manuscript his housekeeper found while going through his belongings shortly after his death in 1678. In 20th century, critics began to acknowledge him as an outstanding poet of his time and got acclaimed for To His Coy Mistress as a truly great poem. This poem is considered one of Marvel's finest and quite possibly the best recognized Carpe Diem poem in English. The term metaphysical is applied to English and continental European poets of the 17th century was used by Augustan poets John Dryden and Samuel Johnson to criticize those poets for their unnaturalness. As Goth wrote, however, the unnatural that too is natural and the metaphysical poets continue to be studied and revered for their intricacy and originality. John Dunn along with similar but distinct poets such as George Herbert, Andrew Marvel and Henry Vaughan developed a poetic style in which philosophical and spiritual subjects are approached with reason and often concluded in contradiction. Reacting against the deliberately smooth and sweet tones of much 16th century verse, the metaphysical poets adopted a style that is energetic, uneven and rigorous. It has also been labelled the, as the poetry of strong lines. John Donne was the most influential metaphysical poet. His personal relationship with spirituality is at the centre of most of his work and the psychological analysis and sexual realism of his work marked a dramatic departure from tradition and refined verse. Andrew Marvel is also a metaphysical poet, just like John Donne. He too wrote love poems, the use of imagery, the rhyme pattern employed to relate his ideas, the way Marvel puts his arguments to seduce his mistress, have something in common with that of Donne's poetry.
the first two lines of Andrew Marvels to his coy mistress led readers into a poem of persuasion in which the speaker attempts to convince his mistress to love him or to enter into a physical relationship with him. His point is that these lovers do not have world enough or time enough to wait for that kind of relationship. Therefore, the lady's coyness is in fact a crime. The first two lines lead us into a stanza describing a world in which the lovers live forever. The man courting his mistress eternally. He appeals to the woman's desire for control and flattery. Marvel mirrors the first two lines of the poem with the form of first stanza, moving from space to time. In lines 7 through 10, the speaker again argues that in an ideal world, his love for the mistress could not be weakened by time. Most analysis of this poem agrees that the conversion of the Jews reference Christ return to earth or the end of the world. The next few lines have been heavily debated about. The most apparent interpretation within the context of Marvel's time theme is that a vegetable takes plenty of time to grow large and ripe. A vegetable can be a simple metaphor for his love. There are plenty of ways that these curious lines can be interpreted. However, the most striking aspect of the phrase is its unconventional nature. In the judgment of Marvel, Christine Rees notates this, quote, instead of the rose, he resorts to the notorious vegetable to define not beauty but love, unquote. Marvel's contemporaries often used the rose or a flower to describe a woman's beauty. Marvel stays away from the stereotypical conceits and uses a vegetable as a symbol, but he focuses on love and the heart. He does not describe physical beauty alone to flatter the mistress. And using unconventional conceits elevates the speaker's persuasive ability. The second stanza begins with a but, where the speaker reverses his logic and tries to make the real world with limited time seem problematic to the mistress. Her dream world may be more desirable, but it is unattainable. The speaker takes us back into the reality of time, space and mortality. He brings time and space together as a terrible force. But at my back, I always hear time's wing chariot hurrying near and yonder all before us lie deserts of vast eternity. He describes the mistress in her death lying in a marble vault. Rees argues that in these lines, Marvel conjures in quotes, two opposite but related phobias. Terror of wide open spaces heightened the fear of pursuit, terror of confined spaces. In both environments, human action and pleasure ceases. So, the speaker amplifies the frightened aspects of being alone within time and space in hopes of making togetherness seem favorable to the mistress. He becomes more intense as the stanza continues in quotes, Nor in thy marble vault shall sound my echoing sound when worms shall try, that long preserved virginity and your quaint honor turn to dust, and into ashes all my lust, unquote. Based on this description, if coyness is not a crime, it is a characteristic to grow out of rapidly. She must seize the chance to give herself to him quickly. Two for time's winged chariot 
could arrive in 50 years or today to make the mistress's life. The speaker counts on this thought to enter her mind by the third and final stanza. In the final stanza, he suggests that there is something the two of them can do to make use of their time on earth, which is to experience their love through a physical relationship. It is a pity that readers cannot know the mistress's answer. Marvel starts by appealing to the women's sentiments as every man who wants something from a woman should do. He claims he would think about her while they are apart. Quote, Thou by the Indian Ganges would complain. Unquote. In this dream world, distance does nothing to spoil the speaker's love for his mistress. The speaker chooses to glorify the position of the woman who finds rubies where she dwells. In comparison, the speaker's dwelling space by the humble seems dull and lowly, where he forces the mistress to pity his position by describing their state of separation. By the third stanza, the speaker has finished flattering his love with dreams, leaving her scared of dying without experiencing love as something physical. He begins the stanza with a strong, now therefore. The language changes drastically from a loving grandiose tone to animalistic and rugged. Marvel writes it as a very active submission. Let us roll all our strength. By rolling into one ball and molding together, the lovers destroy any fears that space might instill within them. Marvel writes as a powerful and eloquent couplet to complete the poem. Time cannot stop for the lovers. They can choose to live life passionately, though passing through time without fear. Marvel ends the poem with a phrase that does not describe a physical relationship. The final four lines make one last final plea for the mistress to surrender herself to him. The most interesting part of the final couplet is the use of the imagery of the sun, which is S-U-N. For apart from its reference to Apollo and time, it was also used to place the word sun, which is S-O-N. During the Renaissance and the 17th century, poets such as Shakespeare, Herrick and Marvel elaborated on the theme Carpe Diem. It means seize the day. The theme of Carpe Diem is enjoy yourself while you can. The theme is found in Greek as well as in Latin poetry and is used extensively by the 15th and 16th century love poets in their appeals to their mistresses not to deny them. The reason for the frequent use of this motif should have been the realization of the briefness of life and the inevitability of death. At first look, To His Coy Mistress is a typical Carpe Diem poem. It is a plea to a young lady. It is also obvious that the speaker pursues passion rather than true love. The speaker starts his argument first by trying to convince her with flattery, telling her how charming she is. And then he says time is flying and death is certain. And lastly, his romantic mood turns into that of a passionate one. And he tells her that they should seize the day. Dramatic monologue in poetry is by definition one person's speech. It is offered without clear analysis or commentary, placing emphasis on subjective qualities that are left to the audience to interpret. Though the technique is evident in many ancient Greek dramas, the dramatic monologue as a poetic form achieved its first era of distinction in the work of Victorian poet 
Robert Browning. Browning's poems, My Last Duchess and Soliloquy of the Spanish Cloister have become models of the form. To his coy mistress takes the form of a dramatic monologue. The speaker of the poem does all the talking which makes this a monologue, a speech by a single character. But because he isn't just talking to himself but to another fictional character, the mistress it is a dramatic, hence the term dramatic monologue. Although the reader might identify with the speaker in a dramatic monologue or with the silent character addressed, there is always the sense that the reader eavesdrops on an intimate conversation. The sense is heightened in this poem because the speaker doesn't give us any personal or biographical information about himself or the mistress to create separation between the characters and the readers.